So do you know that we are only two weeks away from Easter? We're having the Easter egg hunt today. And I don't know if you know this, but at the Ferguson household, we're not big Easter bunny people. And you might have reasons for why you think we're not big Easter bunny people. Um, There really isn't any, like, backstory there except for forever when the kids were little, we did the Easter egg hunt here at the village, and that was kind of how the boys got their baskets filled. But when I started to think about it, I wonder if one of the reasons why the Easter bunny wasn't a big deal in the Ferguson household is because of a story that my parents told me on repeat. Do you have any of those? Your parents just tell you the same story over and over and over again. Like, I know, I can tell it back to you. So now I'm gonna tell it to you. Okay, so I was three years old, and um, my mom was outside looking for the Easter Bunny. And my dad was inside with me. And my dad was quite the storyteller. And so I'm three years old, and I'm excited. I'm excited to learn about the Easter Bunny. And my dad said, he's big, and he has great big teeth. And when he jumps, he thumps and thumps and thumps and thumps. And do you know where the eggs come from? And, you know, three-year-old me, like, no, Dad, I don't know where the eggs come from. He's like, under his tail. Do you know what's under a rabbit's tail? And I'm like, what? He's like, that's right. The big Easter bunny with the big teeth poops out the Easter eggs. And about that time, my mom comes back in to excitedly tell her little girl, hey, I just saw the Easter bunny. I'm like, I'm not going out there. (laughs) Now, at the time, as a little girl, evidently, I didn't understand why my dad was in trouble. Um... And it's ridiculous, right? Like as adults, we all know that everything that was outside, nothing was gonna hurt me. But that's what we do in life, isn't it? We look at our current situation, how we understand it, what we see with our eyes and what we feel with our feelings, and we determine that's all there is. There's a definition of fear that is called false evidence appearing real. We look at the current facts that we have access to, and that determines our level of fear. We're in this series called Good News. And some of you may be sitting there thinking, I could sure use some good news. Well, our title today is, Good News is Beyond Me. And some of you are thinking, isn't that the truth? But I want to reframe that. I want you to think about that three-year-old little girl inside the house. Good news was beyond her. It was there. But the facts in her brain and the feelings she was feeling wouldn't let her see it. See, sometimes good news is beyond us because thankfully, God is working beyond us. But our question that we face every day is, okay, so God is working beyond me, but what do I do right now? And we're going to look at the story of Esther today, where good news seemed beyond God's people in a very tough situation. So I'm going to set you up. We are going to start in Esther chapter 2, but I've got to, I'm going to tell a lot of the story today. Um, But Esther, the book of Esther, happened during the Persian Empire around 483 BC. And if you find that to be boring... You're going to find this next piece really boring, okay? Because I love history, and you're going to have to indulge me because I'm the one speaking today, okay? And so one of the things that I love about the Bible and I love about history is that when we watch them collide, and do you know that you can go to the University of Chicago Museum right here in Chicago, and you can go visit this sculpture, 
It's the sculpture of the bull's head that hung inside King Xerxes' palace. And it says it right there. University of Chicago, it'll say King Xerxes, 480 BC. And so this is one of the cool things about the Book of Esther, is that it lines up historically with what we know as history. And it also has this folklore to it that we're going to talk about at the end about something that has been passed down through the generations. Another interesting thing about the book of Esther is that the name of God is never mentioned. But his presence and his influence is woven throughout the story. And I think that's a great reminder that even in times in our life when it feels like God is distant, it might be our perception because it's definitely not God's reality. And that's good news. That no matter what's going on in our life, God is working ahead of us and beyond us. So like I said, we're going to be in the book of Esther. I want to catch you up because we're going to start in chapter 2. But here's what has happened preceding that. King Xerxes has thrown a seven-day party. Yep seven days, and he is trying to show off how wealthy he is and how big his kingdom is, and he's maybe had a little too much to drink, and King Xerxes decides what he's going to do to finish off this party is have his beautiful queen come out on display wearing only her crown. Queen Vashti is her name, and she's not having it. She thinks that her husband's had a little too much to drink, and she's not going to parade around in just a crown. And so he decides she's not her. After a lot, there's a lot of chapters, you need to read the book of Esther. Okay, this is a fantastic book. After lots of counsel, Queen Vashti is vacated from being the queen, and now there's been a decree issued to every territory that the king wants all the beautiful young women to come because he wants to pick out a new queen. And that's where we're going to pick up the story. The, in this story, there are a few key characters. One of them is Esther, who is a Jewish orphan. And then the other one is Mordecai, who is her cousin. And we're going to read about this. Now, there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, I can never say that, king of Judah. Okay, Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. So the big piece of this to understand is Esther's a knockout. She's an orphan. Okay? Then it says, when the king's order and edict has been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Hegei. Esther, who was also taken to the king's palace, entrusted to Haggai, who had the charge of the harem. She pleased him and won his favor. Immediately, he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place in the harem. Okay, why bring out this piece of the story? Because you know what I think is interesting? Esther was in a tough situation. Her mom and dad had died. And her cousin kind of is hoping to like move up in the hierarchy, right? By having her picked as queen. And she could have refused. And she could have been angry. And she could have let the unfairness kind of make her a little bitter. 
And I think that when we find ourselves in unexpected circumstances, sometimes we tend to become self-centered. At least I become, like, I get on this cycle of, like, what's not fair. And, like, in my brain, I just want to be like, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to say that, and I'm going to say this. But we could take a lesson out of Esther. And when we find ourselves in a place of unexpected circumstances, we could seek out guidance like she did. So she's like, okay, so Haggai, he's the guy in charge. I'm going to ask him what I should do. And I'm going to be super kind. And that's where God starts to work, right? God's always working inside of righteousness. So let's jump down to 16. She's taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the 10th month of that month in the seventh year of his reign. And now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women. And she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And so now she's queen, but guess what? The king doesn't know that she's a Jew. He doesn't really know where she's come from. He just knows she's beautiful. And then what happens next, you've got to go home and read the book of Esther. It reads like a movie. What happens next is kind of weird, and it seems abstract. But Esther becomes queen, and then we hear Mordecai is still hanging out, out by the city gate. And he overhears somebody is going to try to kill the king. And so he tells Esther, he's like, hey, somebody's going to try to kill the king. Turns out that's true. The people are punished. But nobody ever rewards or even acknowledges that Mordecai is the one who figured it out. And then the story picks back up. And there's another key character. There's always a bad guy in every good story. And the bad guy here is Haman. And Haman comes on the scene, and he's not good at all. He hates all the Jews. Nobody really knows this yet, but we know this in the background. And then this is the next verse that we're going to read. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman. For the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Now, this doesn't seem like that big of a deal. And I think most of us, because if you grew up listening to any Bible stories or anything like that, you're like, yeah, I, I wouldn't kneel down to him either. Haman's this big, mean guy. He doesn't like the Jews. Mordecai's at the city gate. He doesn't kneel down to him. But you know what? This is just a cultural norm. So let me ask you this. If you went to England, would you curtsy to the queen or bow to the king? Probably. You know why? It's just a cultural thing. It doesn't mean anything. And that's what's happening here, too. Like, it's not like... Mordecai, if he did bow to Haman, was doing something awful. But to Mordecai, he was like, you know what? This guy's rude. And I'm not going to bow to him the way I bow to my God. And so he's kind of just like had it with Haman. And when Haman sees this, he not only is mad at Mordecai, but it enrages him even more that the Jews are living in his city. It's like because Mordecai's a Jew, because Mordecai won't do this, then that makes something wrong with all of the Jews. And so then we pick it up and it says, Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed, dispersed among all the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all the other people. 
and they do not obey the king's laws. It's not the, in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them. I, Haman, I'll give you the king, I'll give you 10,000 talents of silver just for the ability that we can issue this decree and get rid of all these people who aren't honoring you. Their customs are described, if we can go back one, as different from all the other people. And I want to take a side note here real quick. And I want to ask you, anybody that calls themselves a Jesus follower, if, if you don't call yourself a Jesus follower yet, you can pull out your phone and scroll for just about one minute, okay? But if you f- call yourself a Jesus follower, do your customs and behaviors set you apart differently than the friends who don't call themselves Jesus followers? Paul said it this way, be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Let me ask you this question. If you're a Jesus follower, do your customs and traditions look different? Does your faith in God make you stand out? Does your commitment to honesty and integrity distinguish you from all the people who say they don't follow Jesus? Does your compassion and your kindness stand out? Can people see a difference in your family and how you treat your friendships different than how people who don't follow Jesus treat theirs? That's who Mordecai was. Okay, so back to the story. Let me catch you way up. Remember, you have to go home and read Esther. King Xerxes gives the signet ring to Haman. Haman sends out a decree that on a certain day, all the Jews are going to be annihilated. Every man, woman, and child. And when Mordecai finds out about this decree, he's devastated. And he shows his grief by wearing sackcloth and ashes and wailing loudly at the gate. And Esther hears about it. She doesn't hear him. I'm sure somebody's like, there is this crazy lunatic at the gate that's doing all these things. So she sends clothes to him. Like, maybe he doesn't have any clothes. Like, put your clothes back on and stop making a fuss. And Mordecai explains to the messenger everything that happened and and pleads to Esther for mercy. And Esther's hesitant because she's like, I can't, I, I can't help you. And Mordecai says, please go to the king and ask for help. And then this is what's reported back. When Esther's words are reported back to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. And he says, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews, it will arrive from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you've come to your royal position for such a time as this. You know what I love about this part of the story? Mordecai is focused on God. He's focused on what God's doing beyond them. He's basically saying, we can join God with what he's doing or we can hide But either way, God's plan is going to be the best outcome. Mordecai sees what God's doing beyond. And so then Esther sends this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together with all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days or night, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. 
So at first, Esther's hesitant. And what I love about this, that so many times when we read the book of Esther, we don't pick up on, is that when she's scared, the very first thing she does is go to prayer. Now, I'm going to catch you up on the story. She goes to the king. She tells him he's, she's a Jew. She pleads for her salvation. And then through a dramatic series of events, all these things happen. King Xerxes can't fall asleep. Somebody reads him a dialogue of things, and he rem- he's reminded that Mordecai saved his life. So then he's like, who is this Mordecai? Haman is exposed for being this evil man and the scheme, and he hangs Haman. I mean, you got to go home and read the book, but the whole point of what we're talking about today is that so often the good news is beyond what's happening right in front of us. And so this is happening in 486 BC. There's no internet. There's no phones. So by the time the king realizes that Mordecai's a Jew and Esther's a Jew, there's no way to get news out to everyone to stop the decree, to stop the annihilation. And so what had to happen is they had to get word out best that they could that the Jews were allowed to fight for themselves. That's the best that they could do. And when they pick up the story, it says, the Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them. And they did what they pleased to those who hated them. Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes near and far. And he said... Have them celebrate annually the 14th and the 15th days of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow was turned to joy and their mourning into celebration. He wrote for them to observe the days as the days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. I said at the beginning, Esther's really interesting because historically we see what happens, but also through religion and through the telling of stories, we see this story live on through Judaism. Do you know that Jews still celebrate this feast? It's called the Feast of Purim, and it's happening this coming Saturday. Saturday uh, in 2024, it's going to happen on Saturday, March 23rd. And Jews around the world at sundown on Saturday, we'll start celebrating. They'll celebrate by reading the book of Esther, giving to the poor, sending food to each other, and feasting. They'll have parades and they'll dress up in costumes to remember the day that God was working beyond them. And I'd like to encourage you to celebrate Purim. It would be such a good tradition if as believers we could learn to recognize that even in our darkest moments, even when it feels like there is no hope, there is no way to save ourselves, that God's working beyond us. See, there's something special about Sunday mornings. There's something special about coming to church and hearing other people sing. And seeing other people sit and believe the same thing. Because it's a reminder that it's not just about what God can do for us. It's a reminder of what God can do through us for others. The good news is beyond us. Maybe you're here today because you think you're out of options. Your marriage is struggling. Work is a challenge. The illness isn't relenting. Boy, money is disappearing, isn't it? And you're hoping for a miracle. 
just like Mordecai and Esther could not see God's hand at work in their life at first. I mean, if you really go back and think about it, they'd been exiled. Esther was an orphan. Mordecai was taking on a child that he didn't have money to raise. There might be some of you here today that are just as skeptical. I don't see it. You can't see that the Easter eggs are full of candy. Maybe you're not seeing God's work in your life right now. But that doesn't mean he's not there. Remember that acronym? False evidence appearing real. The good news is beyond us. And it's beyond our circumstances. I began today by saying, if good news is beyond you, what can we do right now? When we come to faith in Christ, we're promised a new mind, a new heart, and new desires. And this is so that we can shift the perspective from just our problems to what God wants to do in our lives and through others. And so we have a few things to remember. Number one, God is at work and he has a perfect plan. But number two is what you can do. You can join what God is already doing. And this is a hard one. This is a hard one for me. This is a hard one whether you, I've been following Jesus since I was 12, and it's hard if you're just starting the journey. Instead of going to the Lord and asking him, what are you doing in my life right now? It's living a life more like Mordecai where you're thinking about what's God doing in their future? What is God doing for his people? What's God's plan for love here? What does God desire? What does God want me to do to be a part of his beyond? Join what God is doing right now even if right now you can't see what he's doing in your own life. The good news is beyond us. And I am so glad. Paul writes, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. 